Today, um, we continue the series, Faith Runs Deep. In our services, in our life groups, we'll hear some stories about the role that faith has played and continues to play in Australian society. Uh, in your life groups, you'll hear stories uh, from um, Australians, ordinary, everyday Australians, whose Christian faith influences how they go about doing everyday life. The challenge and hopefully encouragement to all of us from this series is to explore our own story, to reflect on who and what has played a role in our journey of faith and to ask the question, what impact does the good news about Jesus have on those around me? What difference does faith make in my household, in my workplace, in the community and in this nation? What are our stories of faith? What is your stories of faith? This week, uh, it's been set down that one of the key themes is reconciliation. This is an important word. It's a biblical word. And it's important for us to take some time to explore this personally, what reconciliation means to us, and also to explore what reconciliation means to our nation, particularly when it comes to the relationship between Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul the, the Apostle, given special responsibility of God, wrote these words to a church, a church in Ephesus. These words are important for each of us to consider and each of us to think through. Paul says this, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He's united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commands and regulations. He made peace between Gentiles and Jews by creating in himself one new people from those two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. The starting point for many of us who are here in the building and online is to remember again that we needed to be reconciled to God. The starting point this morning in this message is for us not to forget to remember that each of us, each of us needed the cross of Christ in order to be reconciled back to God. And as Emma pointed out, none of us, none of us had any advantage with that. None of us stood any taller or had a better position. We all, we all needed the cross. None of us could get back to God, to be in a right relationship with God through our own goodness, through our efforts, through maybe what people might say about us, our reputation. We all needed the cross. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, would you guide what happens now? Would you help us to be open to your spirit? Would you help us to hear your words? And really, um, just a be ready and open to take them in. I want to thank you for Fred and Margaret. I want to thank you for their example of faithfulness, their example of obedience and their humility. And I pray a blessing on them. I thank you too for this church, for so many things over so many years. And Lord, I pray that this morning we might have ears to hear and we might be ready to obey. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot that we can learn <clears throat> from looking back through our history here in Australia. And I want to say this, 
I believe that there's a lot we can learn from the history of this church community over the past 50 years. So much has changed, not just in the way we conduct our services, but our attitudes and in the makeup of this church community. And I really hope and pray that we will continue to be open to God shaping us so that we will continue to seek to honour him and be useful in his mission. I've been part of this church community since I was born, a long time ago. I've been part of the staff team here at Hume Ridge and before that, Margaret Street, for 39 years. And I could go on and on like some old, old person about how back in the day, or I could talk about, 90, about people that 90% of you would have no idea about. But I want to confine my attention to one area. And what I say is not in any way a criticism of anyone. The church here at Hume Ridge bears very little resemblance to the Margaret Street Church of Christ, where we came from, the one I grew up in. The fact that this, um, this morning, a young lady has, heard, has led the church in communion. That would have never have occurred, not a chance back in the day. To lead communion required a suit when I was growing up, and that meant only males led communion. It was only males who served communion because serving communion required a tie. And there would have been no way, absolute, Neil's smiling at this, he knows this is true. There would have been no, no way that I, back in the day as a teenager, would have ever, ever worn jeans to church, let alone stepped up on the platform. And the church back then, the church of my teen years, well, there wasn't a whole lot of diversity. There was not a lot of colour. It was a good church, don't get me wrong. And I have so much to be grateful for, for those who faithfully and humbly served at that church, they, that were the church. But if we were honest, it wasn't a real good reflection or representation of our wider community, even back then. And this was highlighted one year in the late 1970s. Church anniversaries back in that day were a big deal. And the church would book a speaker. We would invite the other churches of Christ to join us at the auditorium at the City Hall, and there would be a big combined gathering, evening uh, address and, and gospel message, and it was given a whole lot of attention. That particular year, the speaker was a well-known missionary who was back in Australia for a break. And that evening at the City Hall, he spoke about the gospel message, the good news about Jesus was given for all people. And he spoke about Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, that it was good news for all people. And God's church was to be for all people. And as he spoke that evening to this fairly large gathering, he would from time to time pause and make a comment like this. He would say, oh, I noticed that there seems to be no Aboriginal people here with us tonight. I guess there aren't any Aboriginal people here in Toowoomba. And then he would continue on with his message. And then he would pause a little bit later on and he would say, oh, I've just noticed that there doesn't seem to be anyone here of different ethnic backgrounds. I guess there's no one of different ethnic backgrounds here in Toowoomba. And this continued throughout his whole message. Some teaching and then a comment. He would make the comment that no one in the audience appeared to have any physical disabilities. So I guess that there's no one here in Toowoomba who has to deal with physical disability. He then challenged us to figure out what it would mean for us to embrace the truth spoken by Paul to his apprentice. Paul, speaking to Timothy, said this, This is good and pleases God, our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Not everyone that night appreciated his message or his observations. But I know of one person who left that meeting suitably disturbed. I was in my late teens and had only recently made a decision that I was going to take God seriously. I left that gathering greatly disturbed. 
I had questions, concerns, and lots I wanted to talk to God about. I wasn't critical of our church or the individuals, but I remember really trying to figure out what it would mean for me to try to hear what God was saying to me personally and how I needed to respond to that. Our church community has since those days been on quite a journey and there has been an openness and a willingness to seek how we can be obedient to who he wants us to be. And let's be honest, along the way, there've been plenty of challenges and there's been plenty of costs. And we have sought to move closer to a body of believers that is more representative of our community here in Toowoomba. We want to be a community who seek to honour God's desire to see all people, all people saved. Carl Fays begins this week's video presentation for your life groups with this statement. Australia's history is complex and contentious. And then he says... The history of the treatment of the Indigenous people of this land is an awful story. There is so much we don't know that we've never been taught. Faze then goes on in his presentation to speak of some of that history. And he interviews and hears from Indigenous Christians and historians and researchers and theologians about some of that history. And one of the observations that is made is that while there are too many examples of the church throughout the early stages of, of Australian history failing to stand up for what was right and speak out against the unjust, cruel, inhumane, racist treatment of Aboriginal people, history also records examples of Christians, ordinary, everyday Christians, missionaries, speaking out, standing up for, standing beside Aboriginal people and providing places of shelter and protection. And it has been recognised that had they not been in those places at that time, had they not held their ground, had they not gained, gone against the prevailing ideas of time, many Aboriginal people would have not survived. Years ago, um, someone recommended that I read this book. It's called One Blood. It seeks to provide part of the story of 200 years of Aboriginal encounter with Christianity. The year it was published, in 1991, it won the Australian Christian Book of the Year. And it was said that it provided a comprehensive, exhaustively researched information about that period of time and what the church was doing and not doing. It received strong reviews from both those in the church and those outside the church. And also along the way, it received a lot of criticism because some people didn't think that this was a story that needed to be shared. And also they thought it was their role to defend the church. <clears throat> this is not an easy read. 906 pages is enough to sometimes put people off. And at times the information accounts and accounts of the actions and inaction and attitude of the Christian church in different parts of Australia at various times in history left me years ago feeling angry, frustrated, but overwhelmingly sad. It was almost beyond belief that they could be so cruel. How could they have failed these people so badly? What was wrong with them? Why didn't God do something more? Why didn't God do something to wake up his church? But then I would read a few pages later of the actions of other Christians, Australian Christians, ordinary everyday Christians in history, who often at great personal cost did stand up for God. They stood up for justice and they stood up for Aboriginal people and spoke out against the silence and the abuse, the vicious disregard for human life the horrors that were inflicted on a people who were often powerless. Often these Christians who stood up had to do so without the support of the wider church or those in power. And in the accounts, there would sometimes be recognition from local Indigenous groups of the fact that they survived only because of the actions of that group of Christians or that one Christian protecting and providing when no one else would. I would read these accounts and feel a sense of pride in the Christian church and I would be grateful and impressed by their courage and their obedience but still had questions about why more people didn't join them. 
I knew of which group of Christians I thought God was pleased with and which one represented how I viewed God. But I was also confronted with the question, I wonder which group I would have gone with. Back then, when the prevailing attitude was one of seeing Aboriginal people as inferior, of keeping silent about things, I wonder which group I would have gone with. I hope I would have stood up. I hope I would have stood up for suffering people. I hope I would have had compassion and spoken out because these people were created in the image of God and seen by God as precious. But who knows? Being silent, going along with the crowd, maybe that would have been too appealing and a whole lot easier. Which group would I have found myself in? More importantly, where would Jesus be? Where would have he been? John Harris is the author of this book, One Blood. And he's one of those who'll be interviewed this week in the Life Group presentations. This book was reviewed by the Canberra Times at the time of publication. And it described this book as powerful and extremely disturbing. And I want to say to you that it had that effect on me. I was already suitably disturbed. But now I was questioning more. Now I was kind of bothered by more. And I kept on coming back to God with a conversation about, what are you trying to say to me here? What am I supposed to do? How do I obey you with this? Australia's history is like the history of other countries. It's not all bad and it's not all good. There is a dark side of Australian history. Part of that sad, awful story is the stories of racial oppression hostility and horrible abuse. At the core of racism is the lie that some people are superior or inferior to others. In the Australian context, there's been a narrative of racial superiority that infected society, including the church. One group was seen as being inherently better, worth more, and the other group those considered inferior because of their race, were viewed as the problem. Their pain not legitimate, their struggles not my concern, and their trauma self-indulgent. I want to say clearly that this, this morning is not about making people feel guilty or responsible for the actions of others. There is nothing productive or helpful in that. However, I agree with the American novelist James Baldwin not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. In, 19, in 2021, Canada made the decision to set aside a day for Canadians to reflect on their past. It was a day to listen and learn and to be honest about their history and the effect of certain things on people of their community. They wanted, in 2021 to focus particularly on the trauma caused by residential schools. These residential schools had been set up for decades and Native American children were placed there. This is what the report said. For decades, many Indigenous children in Canada were taken from their families and forced into boarding schools. A large number of those children never returned. Their families were given only vague explanations or none at all. In recent years in Canada, they have found these unmarked mass graves beside and behind these residential schools. Canada wanted a day of action. And their day of action was about listening and seeking to better understand and coming at this with humility. The principle behind this is that we have to go back in order to go forward. We cannot understand our racial situation today until we sincerely examine what has gone on before, for how long it went on, and how that is, has impacted and is still impacting individuals and families. This word reconciliation is an important word. 
This word reconciliation is a biblical word. Reconciliation is an ongoing spiritual process that involves forgiveness, repentance and justice. It involves humility and listening. It comes ready to take the step of sitting quietly and trying our best to understand. In the passage that we've already looked at, it says simply, don't forget. Don't forget. Every Sunday we are encouraged to look back, to remember where we once stood, that we were enemies of God. We stood apart from God. We stood far off from God. And it was his initiative that brought us back to him. I needed to be reconciled to God and I need not to forget that Jesus reconciled me back at great cost, at great cost. He humbled himself. He took on the nature of a servant. He went to the cross and he experienced death so that I might be saved. This is no minor matter, remember. Remember. And so if I'm being asked by God to respond in a certain way, who am I to say that that's too much? Who am I to say that that's outside the scope of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? I'd like to read these words also written by Paul. He says this, But now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He's united Jews and Gentiles into one people in his own body on the cross. He's broken down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending that system of laws and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups. We are reminded that he continues in this process of bringing us back to the Father. Jesus' death on the cross was enough. But Paul goes one step further and he reminds his reader that reconciliation is also to affect our relationship with others. He speaks about the Jews and Gentiles. According to Paul, Christ Jesus has solved the problem of our relationship with God and he invites us now with his help to solve the problem of our relationships with others. He draws people to God and they are drawn close and as they are drawn closer to God, they find themselves being drawn closer to each other. It is not simply a message he proclaimed or even the message proclaimed about him that affects the, this reconciliation. It is himself. Paul announces Christ is peace as well as life and hope. Christ is, Christ is both the peace and the peacemaker. He actually brought about the reconciliation of Jew and Gentile when he died on the cross. There he made both into one. Christ removed the hostility, the hostility that existed between these deeply divided groups. Rich Volandis is the lead pastor at New Life Fellowship in Queens in New York. In his church alone, there are different groups, different uh, people groups who come together for church services. There are 72 different languages that are spoken in his church. He talks about the fact um, <clears throat> that we need to develop a robust definition of the gospel, that the gospel has a vertical dimension of us coming to God but the gospel also has a horizontal dimension of us allowing God's love to impact every other relationship that we have across uh, our, our world. Volander states that it's my conviction that the gospel at its core is not merely the good news of a salvation trans transaction. As wonderful as that transaction is, it's not simply about that we get what Jesus deserved and he's going to take what we deserved and now we're okay with God and we can just live out our days until we go to heaven. 
The gospel at its core is centrally about the story and the victory of Jesus. It's about the risen and enthroned Lord and the good news that he took our place. And further, this gospel has specific purposes for the healing of our world. And one of those main purposes is the creation of a new family and healing amongst people. I am convinced that we need to understand that God has a mission and it's equally to, uh, important to understand that his mission is larger than the church. We in the church often wrongly assume that the primary activity of God is in the church rather than recognising that God's primary activity is in the world and the church is God's instrument sent into the world to participate in God's mission of reconciliation. Too often Christians think that the New Testament was written by Christians to Christians so that they could better understand how to become a Christian or to be a better Christian. The New Testament was written by those who were clear about their mission. The New Testament was written by those who were clear about their mission and they were fully engaged in God's mission. We have become preoccupied with internal debates about what it means to be Christian rather than seeking to engage the world with the truth about God. Paul, in that first book of Corinthians, states this, for, God, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to him through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was holding the world to him, or was reconciling the world to, him, to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is need for us to remember, to be willing to remember, to appreciate the, the reconciliation that we have personally through Jesus. We are reconciled to God the Father we become part of his family purely and completely because of the love and sacrifice of Jesus. And now we have this ministry of reconciliation. We have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation. We are to let others know this God is for them, this God loves them deeply and personally, and that they can know God and be part of his family. This is an important thing for us to con constantly come back to. We need this robust perspective of the gospel, a gospel that highlights the need for us to be reconciled vertically, but also for us to be agents of reconciliation horizontally. There's a, a lady who will speak on the video um, that you'll watch this week. She is an Aboriginal lady who has studied theology at Sydney University and speaks very clearly about the fact that she cannot understand when it comes to the topic of reconciliation in our nation, particularly reconciliation between non-Indigenous and Indigenous, why the church isn't leading the way, why the church too often steps back from this and so this isn't important. I really believe that one of the things that um, we can learn from and we can examine is whether we are ready to humbly listen 
and start from a position and a place of appreciating the pain, the pain that has happened, but the pain that still pervades too many families and too many individuals in our nation. Philander speaks about the church being willing to take up the habit of lament. The act of lament is a spiritually mature response to sadness and sorrow. Lament recognises the struggles of life and it cries out with those who feel injustice and feel overlooked and feel desperately overwhelmed. It names the pain. It speaks about injustice honestly. It acknowledges grief. And it does not shy away from those things as it sits beside those who are experiencing that. I want to say to you that I believe that we have opportunities sometimes just to sit with people and not give them the answers. Not tell them how they should feel. That they should have got over this. But just to sit with them in pain. And to allow that pain to just inform us a bit. Last Friday, not this Friday gone, but the week before, (coughs) I spoke... I had to do the eulogy for a 22-year-old young man who took his own life the week before. He had been a remarkably uh, talented athlete, incredible. And the, the service was at St Pat's and there was standing room only. The whole of St Pat's was full. All down the sides, people were standing. And we had the honour and privilege of farewelling that young man. But I spoke honestly in the eulogy about the pain of that young man. He had come here last year to speak to me about some of his struggles and some of the pain and some of his confusion. At 21, he was trying desperately to figure out um, a whole lot of things. And particularly his worth. There was a whole lot of stuff in that young man's life. He was Indigenous. He had represented Queensland in the Indigenous Rugby League team. He had played beside Selwyn Cobbo and Reese Walsh and all those fellas. But in a very desperate, sad, tragic act, less than two weeks ago, he decided that there was no way forward. And I sat with the family last week on Anzac Day in the afternoon and just listened to their stories. I didn't offer any expert advice. We prayed together. They cried. And I sat with them and did my very best, my very best to share in their pain a pain I can't fully comprehend and a pain I never, ever want to experience. But I want to say to you that I believe that if you're open, God will bring you into contact with people who need you to practice the habit of lament. And we in the church need to get better at really listening and really trying to step into that pain with people, all people. The other habit I want to say is that we need to develop the habit of reconciling prayer. We need to be people of prayer who come before God and speak about the fact that we are grateful for the reconciliation that he has brought for us. And we want to be his agents in bringing reconciliation to others. We want to help people know God. We want to make sure that they have the opportunity that maybe we had to know and experience God's love. But we also want to be agents of Um, reconciliation in our community, bringing people together. Melander states that our response to decisions and discussions, sorry, to our response to discussions on race often is a reflection on our maturity. And as a church, I hope that we will always be open to have respectful careful, 
sensitive discussions on race, to speak openly and honestly and carefully about the whole deal about what's going on in our nation, to feel a sense of sadness for people who are still experiencing pain. Our nation needs reconciliation to be evident, to be carefully done. And our nation needs God. Our nation needs God. I want to read to you a prayer. This is a prayer that is prayed um, in Volanda's church. I'm just going to read it to you and then I'm going to ask Brendan to come forward. But I would say this. Um, when we were given the topics and the outline sheets for this series, um, I saw last week's and this week's and there was part of me, part of me that thought, uh, I really hope Brendan wants to do these. I was really ready to pass them off. I know that speaking about this in this church, there's a risk that some will kind of push back. There'll be some that won't want to... Um, this is not an easy topic. And when we're talking about reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, people have all sorts of opinions, strong opinions. I'm not here to tell you what to, you should think or what you should believe about this. But I want to challenge you to take it to God. And if you get disturbed by what he's saying to you, welcome. Welcome to the club. And if you're really open and continue to seek him in this, there'll be opportunities for you to be agents of reconciliation across the board. This is the prayer of Alandis. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, in word and deed, by what we have done and what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. And today, we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For your sake, for the sake of your son, Jesus, please have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and that we may walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Stay standing and I want to pray a prayer for you uh, and a prayer as we leave today and we go into this week appreciating what God has done and seeking to just be open to allow Him to use us wherever and however He wants. Um, this morning was never ever about um, diminishing um, the good and the efforts of so many in our land uh, throughout the history. It's not about... Um, trying to diminish um, all that has gone on that has kind of helped people and pointed them towards Jesus and towards a God of love. But it is about recognising that there is still pain and we are God's people. We are called to His mission, His mission. And the primary activity of God is not in this building, it's out there need to be ready to join God where he sends us and what he wants us to do. This church over the last 50 years has made just a massive difference in my understanding of who God is, of how great his love is. And I have been constantly challenged and encouraged by your example to continue to embrace and include and care for those that so often didn't have a place. So I'm going to pray and then there'll be some of the elders that'll be at the front here. And if there's been something that has stirred within you or you want to talk about that, or you want to talk about making sure that you know that you've been reconciled to God, that you are in the right place with God through Jesus, um, you come and talk to one of the elders. 
We would love to pray with you and just share with you. If you'd like to just come forward with a couple of people, um, that's fine as well. We want to give you this opportunity. I'm going to pray. May the love of Christ be active in your heart, be heard in your words, be seen in your actions and inform all your choices today and every day this week. Father God, help us to listen, to listen to that still quiet voice, that prompting. Father, help us to be ready to set aside some of our ideas, some of the things that we hang on to, just to be ready to listen to those around us who need to know that they are still seen, they still matter, and that you are for them. Help us this week as we go into this week to have a fierce awareness of your presence and your love for us and for others. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.